Let's talk a little bit about the format and get this party started. All right. Um, after you uh, make your opening statements, I have two little bags, my little bags. The questions have been divided into how will you get it done and working with the community, all right? You all have had these questions in advance, most of them. And so they shouldn't be a surprise to you. But each candidate will be asked one question and a different question at a time, OK? And we'll go through the questions. And if we run out of questions, we'll recycle. All right? <laughs> All right. Um, the reason why we're not asking the public to add any questions to our list, we uh, produce these questions with the public's input, but we're not asking for them tonight because we really want to hear from the candidates tonight and how they feel about these issues that are important to us here in the community. What we don't want to have tonight is a debate, and we don't want to have an argumentative discussion about the issues. We just want to know how they stand on it. Now, you will make up your mind about who to vote for, given their response to our questions. So let's start with the first person who came tonight, who actually got here at 6 o'clock, and that'll be Ms. Barry. <laughs> Um, we ha I'm sorry, I just want to add one more thing, Ms. Barry, and for the rest of you, is that the League of Women Voters uh, will be our timekeeper tonight. They will keep you to the two minutes or one minute that you have, and so she'll be flashing cards for you. So please be respectful of that so that we don't have to, you know, cut off your mic or drag you off with a hook. All right? Sound good? Yes. All right, Ms. Barry, thank you. Beg your pardon? Yes, well, she's going to introduce herself, and I'm hoping she'll say your name. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gloria Berry. I thought tonight I'd go ahead and describe what it's like to run for supervisor. Some of the things that people say to you along the road. One of the first interesting comments was, for me, unless I raised over $100,000 that I shouldn't even be in the race. But what that person didn't know is there's a lady in Bronx, New York, named Alexandria Cortez, and she raised 1 16th of the establishment's chosen person. So that didn't deter me. The next thing I was told was, as a woman, you have to prove yourself. You can't be modest. You have to speak more on your accomplishments. Because when a man walks in the room, he could wear a suit and automatically get respect and uh, credibility. So my accomplishments are as follows. I served this country for 12 years in technical communications field. I was entrusted with writing policy and making decisions for people, thousands of people's lives. After that, I went into law enforcement for eight years for the state of California. I was an expert at de-escalation. I held hearings and investigations, and I'm a fact finder. The third thing said to me that I wanted to uh, speak on is what am I gonna do for District 10? My priorities are education, drug treatment, and police brutality. I chose education as first because I know when you find yourself in a hole, education is what's gonna help you dig out of it. And drug treatment, I think we need to help people and then we need to help them again because all of us are one injury away from being addicted to opiates. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Shimon Walton. I am a member of the San Francisco Board of Education, executive director of a 45-year workforce development organization in here in Bayview, young community developers, and native San Franciscan. This run for me as supervisor of District 10 is personal. I am originally from public housing here in Bayview Hunters Point, uh, lived in West Point, which is in Bayview, which is now known as Hunters View and which is being revitalized right now. I also lived in public housing in Patrell Hill, as well as I'm the former director of the Patrell Hill Family Resource Center, 
and former program officer for the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. So I've been working in this community for several decades, making sure that we get the resources and opportunities that we need here in District 10. <clears throat> We've been isolated in so many ways for so long, from the transportation issues that exist, from the health disparities and health issues that exist in our district, and we need someone who's actually been tackling that already to make sure that when they get elected on November 6th, they can continue to move this district forward. So I talk about proven leadership that we need today. I've built affordable housing in this district, 59 units, 100% affordable. Currently building 156 units, 100% affordable. I've worked and written proposals with other community-based organizations to bring another navigation center to Bayview Hunters Point on Bayshore so that we can fight homelessness that will be here within the next month. So besides mental health supports and substance abuse supports, we'll also have a jobs program included. We need somebody who can go in and get elected on November 6th and fight for our issues right away. I'm supported by eight current members of the Board of Supervisors, our current mayor, our current assembly members, both of them, our current senator, and all of my colleagues on the Board of Education, and many people in this room and community leaders. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Tony Kelly, and in the past 15 years, I know a lot of people in this room already because we've worked together already to save schools and parks, create the first green benefit district in the country to get more open space that we can support out here in District 10. I worked with Bayview's 100 Point neighbors to close power plants, to clean up dirty soil underneath developments, to get diesel fuel out of Muni buses, and fight for a proper cleanup of nuclear waste at the Hunters Point shipyard for over 12 years now. I worked with the neighbors all over the district for 15 years to save and create affordable housing and blue collar jobs and demand that we have development without displacement. I've helped create coalitions against police violence and, and for housing homeless families and for creating a public bank that can finally get us the housing and the infrastructure that we need out here in District 10 after so long. And I've been lucky enough to work with you and most of the hosts of this event tonight over the years. My policies aren't put on a piece of paper because they sound good in an election year. They come from that work day in and day out with residents and businesses and workers and tenants and families across District 10 and trying to fight for changes against a city that really only thinks we're important out here when they can make money off us or take our land. So how about you? How's the status quo working out for you? Do you think the city's on the right track or not? Do you feel represented at City Hall? Do you feel like politicians are working for you or for someone else? We all know friends have been pushed out of the city. A lot of us know families in Bayview where three generations have died of the same cancer. We know seniors who live on one meal a day. We know long-time renters who know that the for sale sign means you're out and that the new building across, across the way means this is for us and not for you. So we know we need to stand up for ourselves and we need change. Let's talk tonight about the change we need and how to get there. All right, how's everybody doing this evening? That was kind of weak. How's everybody doing this evening? All right, that is a whole lot better. My name is uh, Theo Ellington. Uh, and like my fellow uh, colleagues here, I am running for District 10 supervisor. Uh, you know, I'm running because San Francisco has really lost its way. And it's unfortunate that District 10 is left to fill all of the city's inequalities. You know, it used to be, you know, when my grandfather uh, moved here, uh, he got a good paying job. He saved up enough money to purchase a home. And he put all his family in there. If my grandfather was alive today, he wouldn't be able to afford to live in San Francisco. My mother raised my brother and I. She corrected me the other day. I used to say $30,000 a year. Uh, she said that was way too much. Uh, she raised me on $18,000 a year uh, working over at Candlestick. If we were to replay that, we would not be able to afford to live in San Francisco. My experience bodes well for this supervisor seat. I'm the only candidate sitting here who has experience in both the public and private sector. Uh, on the public side, uh, I sat as commissioner for the San Francisco Redevelopment Successor Agency, where I led the creation of 1,500 units here in San Francisco. 
a thousand of which were deemed affordable, 242 of which were for formerly homeless population. I most recently, uh, as of uh, a month ago, stepped down from the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. It was there I stood up for uh, the city's anti-discrimination policy. I stood up for, to uphold the sanctuary city policy. On the private side, uh, I most recently was director of public affairs for the Golden State Warriors. It was there that I held new arena developers accountable to this very neighborhood. Just as I will do it uh, in the seat of supervisor, uh, you have my commitment to stand on beside of you to stand up for this very neighborhood. This is why residents and I are leading a lawsuit against Tetra Tech for fraudulently, fraudulently faking the soil samples at the Hunters Point shipyard. Uh, thank you, and I am looking forward to a fruitful discussion tonight. Good evening, everybody. So my name is Uziri Napenda Pease Green, and I am running for supervisor of District 10. I am not, nor will I ever be, a politician. And I say that because I live in Patrol's public housing. I live right on Dakota Street. And I'm running for supervisor because it is time for our voices to be heard. So with the job that I have, so many times I was in the rooms in City Hall and other places, and I was able to see how the decisions are made. And myself being a resident, the only reason I was at that table is because of the position that I had. Nobody comes down and talks to anybody that's down here on the streets. They don't talk to the business owners. They don't talk to the homeowners. Just a lot of decisions are made inside the rooms without anybody knowing what's happening on the, that's how it's affecting us down here on the ground. So no, I don't have a whole list of endorsements. No, I don't. I don't have a whole list of people that's backing me. And I have definitely not raised $100,000. I think I might have raised about $4,000. And I am very proud to say that. Because right now, I don't think what Bayview needs, I don't think that what District 10 needs is a politician. We need somebody that's actually going to sit down, listen, and actually understand and know what people are going through. And one of the things I want to talk about tonight is domestic violence, because that's something that we haven't been brought to the table. And that's for both men and women. So you can Google me, because I have a lot of accomplishments underneath my belt. And I've worked with a lot of members in the city, and I've worked with a lot of people in my neighborhood. So Uzuri Napenda Peace Green is my name, and I live in Patrol Hill Public Housing on Dakota Street. Thank you. My name is Salah Hakuir Chandler, and I am truly thankful for this opportunity to be here tonight. Many of you who have been watching these presentations have noticed that I have not been involved. So therefore, I am not really well practiced because I have not been invited. One of the reasons I had not been invited was because I choose not to choose a political party. I am a single mother of two, one boy and one girl. Yalani Yemas Chinyamarende was murdered three years ago, the quadruple homicide that happened in Hayes Valley. He was the young man that was simply just trying to cash his check on his half an hour lunch break. I have been doing this work for 29 years, and what I mean by doing this work, I can go into the entrepreneurship programs that I started in Visitation Valley. I can go into starting out with L.O. Hill Hutch. I can go into uh, sitting on the PTA. I can go into the fact that those polls on Third Street at this time, the black, red, and green was done by me. I can say that now it has voted that the African-American art and culture was inspired by those polls. I can say so many things that I have done. But what I'm bringing to the table today is the conviction of truth. Someone has to have the courage to speak what's going on in this society, and we do not have any democracy. We have been promised through by way of democratic, we have been promised republic, and et cetera. We are in the same condition. 
What are we going to do about it? I'm going to bring transparency. What is transparency? I'm going to break down to you the meaning of the EB-5 and the direct capital funding. Why is it that we do not have businesses of all nationalities? My platform is common ground. You hear the common conversation that everyone is going to bring you jobs. Everyone is going to bring you housing. Everyone is going to bring you education, but let our children can't even read and they in the first grade all the way to the seventh grade and can't, can't read or write in the Bayview. We know the report. We can talk about Ms. all Chandler, the gaps. You've Excuse exceeded me. your time. I beg your oh, I'm sorry. So, um, and I'm thankful that this is not a debate because I just like to have a all discussion. Right. Thank you so kindly. Thank you so much for that. So, Ms. Berry, we're going to start on that end of town. Oh, uh, I mean, uh, not Ms. Berry, Ms. Chandler, we're going to start on that end of town. So, you're going to have the first question, and you have uh, three minutes to respond. And I ask you respectfully if you'll respect our time limit Absolutely. and end exactly at Thank three minutes. So that would be great. So, the first question will be coming from working in the community. Yes. All right. What are your plans for working with neighborhood groups and organizations to gain information as to what community needs really are? The gaining the information is communication. Communication is key. It's about having a relationship with the community. If you don't have a true relationship with the community, you cannot organize. I've been doing this work for 29 years and almost everyone in Bayview know who I am. Why? because I am not a hireling. I'm born for this purpose. I love my community and I love humanity. All right, thank you for that. All right, Miss Peace Green, you're next with working in the community, working with the community. What is your plan to dramatically improve safety in the district? Well, I don't know how dramatically I will be able to do that. Um, it depends on what part of the community and exactly what you're talking about. And so that's going to be to look at what is happening now, sit down and talk with people in the community, because what is needed in Patrol Hill is different from what's needed in Sunnydale. What's needed in Sunnydale is different from what's needed in Bayview. But the collective that we do need is safety, and that starts with our young people first. It starts with the youngsters, the ones that are going into school and are at the tipping point, the ages between 10 and 13 years old, getting to them and getting them involved in the different sports, and not just sports, but then academics as well. And then taking it from there and talking to the parents, the parents, the grandparents, and the great-grandparents, because you have a lot of young mothers and a lot of young fathers out there. And what happens is that it got lost in between my generation and the generation after me. And so it's getting out and really talking to the community and asking them what has been going on in your neighborhood and how can we work together to solve the problem. It's not gonna happen overnight. Because I deal with the police department every day. I deal with my community every day. And then we just, we just had a burial today of a young man who had been really working hard in the community to stop all of this violence. So it's gonna take a lot of us banding together and it also is gonna take for us standing up. I wear these bands every day and I said I live in Patrol Hill and one of them it says Blue Lives Matter. And I say that because of the fact that we have to work together and we can't be scared to stand up. And the only way that we can stand up is if we stand together. That means that we can't be scared to say, no, don't break into that house. No, you shouldn't be throwing those rocks and taking it back to the old school. Because when I was coming up, you could get on me and then you could get on me. And by the time I got home, my mom already knew. And so it's taking it back to where people are actually working together and not being scared, not being scared of retaliation, not being scared to stand up and not being scared to stand up with each other and talk with each other and getting to know each other. Because that's where a lot of the safety goes in is because nobody knows each other in certain parts. But then, and also people are scared to speak up because you'll speak up when you see kids throwing rocks, but you won't speak up when you see somebody break into somebody's house. 
And then you'll start being stigmatized, you start stigmatizing people because a lot of people look at the young men and women because they're sagging, they're bad. And you'd be surprised at how many of them had 3.0 and 4.0s. So it's just really bringing it back to the grassroots. All right, it's mine. Thank you, Ms. Green, Peace Green. All right, Mr. Ellington. Again, we're in the category of working with the community. How do you envision designing Bayview, or I'm sorry, how do you envision designating Bayview as a cultural district benefiting or hurting business? Let's just, sorry. Uh, let's just start by sort of setting the context of uh, what this community means to uh, African Americans. Uh, given the amount of displacement and pressure that this neighborhood has felt, uh, it is unfortunate uh, that many folks that I've grown up with, uh, many family members, uh, many, many of the community members have been forced out of this district. And what we're starting to see is a resurgence. We're starting to see folks come together and stand up for the neighborhood that they deserve. And one of the examples that I like to bring up uh, is the organizations that are bringing the businesses back to Third Street. Uh, we have five brand new businesses coming back to the Third Street corridor. Of the five new businesses coming back, four are African American. Four live in 94124. And that's because there was a collective effort of folks who recognized the cultural significance of Bayview. There's four women-owned businesses that came together and decided that their collective success was determined by how well they can work together and attract other businesses to the corridor. And it was fortunate enough that we are able to see that play out in the next couple of months. Uh, as it pertains to the culture district and spe uh, specifically, we have seen this work in other neighborhoods. We've seen this work in the Mission, where you have a dedicated effort to bringing funds uh, and cultural activities to the neighborhood. Uh, and now we're seeing that play out here in Bayview. And I'm uh, happy that uh, as a chair of the Bayview Opera House, uh, we are an active particip participant in that discussion, where we'll start to bring cultural activities back to the Bayview Opera House, uh, bring cultural activities back to the district. So I think this is a must. Uh, and I would hope that all my colleagues up here agree that this is a must. Uh, and it's really bringing back a sense of place uh, where far too many people have been pushed out uh, here in District 10. Thank you. Excellent, yes. thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Kelly, how do you plan to address the notion that everyone in the Bayview is low income? Well, the reality is different, we know that. The perception worries me because the consequences of the perception that the, if there wasn't that perception that Bayview Hunters Point is all low income and we don't need to care about it, the shipyard would have been cleaned up right now. You know it, I know it. They've had 30 years to do it. And for the last 15 years, I've been working with Green Action, the Sopalinar Action Movement, the Nation of Islam, Bayview residents at Hunters View, all around trying to get accountability and a better cleanup because they've cleaned up other sites in the city that had toxins. The, na the Navy, the city, the developers, but they didn't do it here, and it's because, oh, it doesn't matter. And I've been knocking on doors for the past six, nine, 12 months, and I keep running into people who used to work at the shipyard, and knowing that there's generations where they die of the same cancer, generations where the entire house has asthma, and they gave their lives, they gave portions of their lives, a lot of their bodies, to the work that went on over there. And it's not gone unnoticed that they're finally paying attention this year because a couple of people went to prison and because there are white people living there now. And that is structural racism, that is environmental racism. And so we need to be serious about how we're going to do better. So first, for the shipyard, here's a few specific things that the Board of Supervisors can do so we can stand up for ourselves and make those houses that, that people make more are living in but let's make it healthy for everybody and let's make it right for everybody. So a few things. First, we need a full cleanup of the entire shipyard before any more development happens. Not just testing, but a full cleanup of the whole site. Second, 
we need to kick Tetra Tech out of San Francisco. I know there's lawsuits going on, and I know we want the Navy to cancel their contracts with Tetra Tech, but Tetra Tech has other contracts with city agencies. So the city needs to look in the mirror and do the right thing about Tetra Tech themselves. Third, we need to restore the Restoration Advisory Board. There are people in this room who served on that board. It was the one community oversight over the cleanup of the shipyard, and we need to restore it under city auspices and make that important for the city. Fourth, we need oversight over the oversight of the shipyard. There's the OCII, it's an obscure city agency, and so the Board of Supervisors doesn't have direct control over development at the shipyard. That needs to change. We also need to take care of the racism at the Department of Public Health where they've been denying the health disparities that are making 14 years shorter life expectancy in this district compared to other parts of the city. The same people in charge of where we are today cannot be in charge of where we need to go tomorrow because otherwise we will continue to be kept down and continue to hold this stereotype where the city abandons us and doesn't care about us and frankly pushes our lower income people out while still saying we're low income and shortening our lives. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. <laughs> Mr. Walton, what are your thoughts on integrating the numerous housing projects into the larger District 10 community? Well, I'm glad you asked that question um, because there, there are a few things that I, I know should be the role of a supervisor and a role of someone who's been leading in community. Um, and I've had an opportunity, not just in the past eight years of the, as the executive director of Young Community Developers, to actually work and develop these projects and bring them into community and make sure that things happen the way that they're planned. So for example, in Azuri, knows a lot about this as well. Yeah. When we talk about the projects and Hope SF and Huntersview and Alice Griffith, Double Rock and, and West Point and Patrell Hill and Sunnydale, these are going to be new buildings and communities that have existed for a long time. And so we're gonna have families that finally have an opportunity who've been living in roach infested housing, who've been living in communities where that they, they, they need to be cleaned up. I lived in West Point, I lived in Patrell Hill, and so I understand that. And so now that we have the opportunity for the new housing that's coming in, we also know that we're gonna have 100% affordable, low income, and there's also gonna be market rate. So when we're talking about inclusionary housing and bringing communities together, the thir first thing we need to do is to make sure that everyone has the same amenities in our new housing. So when you bring, when you redevelop Hunter's View, when you redevelop Alice Griffith, we need to make sure that they have the same open space opportunities, that they have the same community rooms so they can do the things and activities and have birthday parties like families have to do. We need to make sure that the same job opportunities are available in our new housing developments when they come in as well. And we've been doing that work for over the years, we made sure that now when we build housing, so we don't make the same mistakes that happened years ago, we're not moving people um, off of their property and then trying to bring them back two or three years later. People are staying and moving into adjacent, adjacent housing in the same housing communities where they lived in. You develop in one area, you build more housing, then you move them back in. That's how we did Hunters View. Phase one, stay in, in, in Hunters View, we built, the first phase, we moved them back over, and we kept doing that in phases. Same thing that's happening in Alice Griffith, same thing that's happening in Patrell Hill with Block X, that's happening right now down at the bottom of 25th and Connecticut. So when we build new housing, we need to make sure that amenities exist that are equitable across the board. We need to make sure that the jobs exist for the new community and the existing community, and that we keep our population indigenous. And we've done that work for a very long time, building all affordable housing, making sure that also community gets to build their own housing. Local mandatory hiring is something that we've been enforcing to make sure that when you build here, the people from this community are also a part of that and the end use jobs that are coming along the way. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Walton. <laughs> Last but not least, Ms. Barry, how will you prioritize the different concerns among the different communities within District 10? I'm gonna stick with my number one priority, 
which is education. Um, as far as priorities is concerned, the city of San Francisco has neglected District 10 since I was a child. I was born and raised in San Francisco in 1969. And ever since the shipyard closed, this district has been neglected. And, and when they needed us in this district for the shipyard, they needed us for jobs. They needed us to work at those ports and do that on safe work. And after they didn't need us, they didn't want us in the schools. They didn't want us to have jobs in other sectors. And they just neglected this um, area. So my priority is education because the main reason is this, the disparity in black, Latino, and Pacific Islander test scores is disgusting. It's the worst in the state of California, our district. And until we make the kids a priority, nothing else is really important to me. The kids come first. So after that, the drug treatment. That's got to be a second priority. You got to keep helping people. You got to provide wraparound services. You got to find out the root of people's problems. It's not going to go away. It's only going to get worse until we make that a priority. And then right behind that, and, and definitely not, not important, is the shipyard issue. I've been working on that for over eight years. And I'm tired of going down to public comment every year and having supervisors say, oh, we care about you, we care about you have cancer, and we're going to give you an award for all the work you've done on this uh, shipyard issue. And the next item on the agenda is an approval to move ahead with redevelopment at the shipyard. We can no longer accept that. So priority is education so that we can know that we being hoodwinked and that we can't accept that anymore. Thank you. OK, this is going way too smoothly. These <laughs> folks have put, done their homework and have answered their questions really well. And I just want to really thank them for you know, coming prepared. Second round of questions. Yeah. And these questions are in the bucket of how will you get it done? All right. Okay. So let's start this time in the middle with um, Mr. Kelly and go to your left. Yes. Let's mix it up a bit. Make sure y'all can follow directions, you know, pat your head, turn around, all that stuff. Okay. I often go to my left. It's great. This is fun. <laughs> all right. How do you plan to address developers in neighborhood blight? <laughs> well, first off, let's be clear about what the blight is. So if we're talking about Third Street and vacancies, there's Leland on, and vacancies. I have a campaign office on 99 Leland Avenue that was vacant for two years before I moved in. The campaign office I've got on 20th Street and Betrayal Hill was vacant for 40 years before we moved in. We got lucky in those two cases, but in a lot of cases, especially on Third Street, the vacancies are due to speculation. The landlords want lower rent. Why? Because they know that rezoning is coming and that they can put offices or housing on the ground floor, maybe not right now, maybe not even next year, but pretty soon, and they can wait. And they're going to make a better deal for themselves. So we need planning. It's not deal making, it's not negotiations, it's not saying, oh, we're special, we're the sheriff, we're the supervisor, we can make things happen when they don't want to. No, we need planning so they have clarity and they know what they can build. We also need a vacancy tax, because we also need to make sure that there's, it's harder to sit on spaces and keep them vacant and not rent, because that's where we get dumping, that's where we get blight, that's where we get abandoned storefronts. Um, that and the vacant properties that we aren't using for open space or maintaining. And that's a lot of city property where that dumping is happening as well. I, I think I'm the only one at this table who knows the tools of development without displacement. And working on the Eastern Neighborhoods Plan for 10 weary fighting years from 2000 to 2010, we had plans specifically about how we were going to increase the population in the Mission, south of Market and Betrayal Hill, but try to keep people there. 
and get the infrastructure we need so we can serve them. And there were two things in particular, I want to tell you just a short story, two things in particular that we wanted in that plan from the community side. I helped write this legislation and it didn't get into the final plan. Two things, one, to use the increased tax revenue, the increased property tax revenue from the new development and put that back into infrastructure in the neighborhood. Bus lines, parks, schools. We're supposed to have two middle schools in Betrayal Hill today, we have zero. The second part was a clawback that if we don't get that infrastructure coming in, the board needs to assert that yes, it is happening, we are getting infrastructure to serve the additional population, and if you don't get it, building permits stop. Well, of course, that didn't fly with the mayor. The mayor and the controller at the time said, no, 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 we have a recession going on in 2008. We need all that money for the general fund. And so here we are adding thousands of people to Betrayal Hill, the Mission, and South of Market, and we have no new bus lines, no new schools, and the only parks we have are because we created the Green Benefit District to support it. So we need to take care of our neighborhoods because City Hall is not doing it for us. You're gonna hear various times about how we're solving our city's problems. I think you know that we're not, especially in this district. And when you can't expect the people in charge today to take us where we need to go tomorrow. We need new leadership to make that happen. Thank you. Mm. Mr. Ellington, how important is keeping and adding parks and open space to the Bayview? And how do, what do you plan to do about it? So if you look at the situation with our parks uh, on this side of the hill. Uh, you know that our parks are some of the worst in the district. If you look at District 10 as a whole, you know that our parks are some of the worst parks uh, in the city. And what we're beginning to see is that all the growth is moving uh, down to the southeast side of town. Uh, therefore, it makes sense that the next wave of upgrades that happen to our parks and open space should happen right here in District 10. I'm going to get a little wonky here, but there's something uh, on the state level uh, that is called the Quimby Act. And what that does is it allocates a certain amount of parks and open space per resident that lives in the area. I think we need something similar in San Francisco. I have a, uh, I have a little dog. His name is Leroy. Uh, and when I'm walking Leroy, it's unfortunate that a lot of our parks in this district have become hotbeds for our homeless population. We've got to change that in District 10. We've got to ensure that we make the necessary investments so that the folks who are homeless get the services that they need in District 10 and all across the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, when I was uh, Director of Public Affairs for the Golden State Warriors, uh, we had a number of programs that helped alleviate some of uh, the financial pressures that Rec and Park was having. Uh, we refurbished basketball courts all across the city. So this can happen in terms of how do we uh, make our parks and open space better. It's going to take the community involvement. It's going to take the private sector and developers stepping up to pay their fair share. And it's going to take City Hall ensuring that this side of town is not forgotten about. We've been dumped on for too long. This side of town needs to be a priority to the rest of City Hall, and you'll get that in me as a supervisor. Thank you. All right, Ms. P. Screen. How do you plan to go about ensuring that we get our fair share of public spaces, resources, for example, open space, rec and park facilities and services, dog parks and libraries? So, to be honest with you, it takes looking at what the residents want. Because in Patrol Hill, we have the Patrol Hill. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. So in Patrol Hill, we have the Patrol Hill Rec Center. We have Martin Luther King Park right here in the Bayview. And then over in Sunnydale, they already have a, um, they have a swimming pool. They have a park. So there are parks. Right now, the park in Patrol Hill is actually being renovated as we speak. So it's looking at what is actually needed inside the community and what the community wants. I don't want to be the type of supervisor that comes in and says, OK, this is what you need, this is what you're going to get, and this is what we're going to do. Right. That's not what people want. People want to know that you're hearing them and that you're actually asking them for their opinion. 
Some people might not, might not want a doggy park in every part of the district. But then at the same time, you have to look at that we do have to have it. I know, I know, some of you dog owners are gonna get mad at me. But it's actually making it to where it's child friendly, dog friendly, and people friendly. And making sure that we are able to be able to do the upkeep of our open spaces. Because right now we do have a homeless situation. And so the more open spaces that we create is more places for people to be able to sleep in. And our libraries, we have some great libraries. We have a library on 20th Street. We have a library that's right here on 3rd Street that just got um, redone. So why not utilize the libraries and the open spaces that we have and expand on them, but then also hiring people from the community to be able to do the upkeep of these open spaces and being able to work in the libraries. Why not hire some of our seniors who are now retired to come in and do story time? Do you know that a lot of our kids don't even know how to do handwriting? They don't teach that in the school. And there's a lot of parents, we used to have, I used to be a latchkey kid. There are a lot of children that come home because their parents are at work. So why not have after school programs at the libraries? at the open spaces and hire some of the seniors to come in to do what they like doing, which is teaching, nurturing, and giving back in the old school way. And I keep going back to the old school way because that's the way I was raised. And that's why even though I did the drugs, the drinking, and everything else, I still had those morals. And there are certain lines that you won't cross when you have somebody that cares about you. So that kid that needs that hug, they can get that at their library or they can get that at their open space. So it's really just incorporating the community and what the community wants and also incorporating in a way where our kids are going to be able to utilize this along with our seniors. Yeah. Thank you. So Ms. Chandler, how do you plan to achieve economic and quality of life balance within District 10? Wow, that's so beautiful economic and quality balance. When the first question was asked to me, I hurried up and I was silent. I didn't complete the full three minutes because this is really kind of unnatural for me to be on the clock. So I kind of froze and wasn't able to really express myself. But I, this is the perfect question that is meant for me to talk about the economics and the balance. And I hear so much of political conversation um, they called it um, um, politically correct. I'm not a politically correct person, but I have this fire here. And what you see is a smile. You have a, this spirit, this smile here. My son was murdered three years ago. And people are asking, how are you standing? One thing that we're not talking about tonight, I haven't heard anyone say, is spirituality. Without spirituality, you have nothing. It is no way on earth we can go through District 10, District 6, 3, 4, and 5 and the condition of San Francisco today. The spirit is dead. We are not alive. We are the walking dead. I constantly hear about uh, this community and how it's been so deprived and abandoned. The question is why? What kind of life, what kind of mind is in us that we have allowed this community to be in this state? We need to be asking ourselves, who are we? It is no way on earth other nationalities will accept the homicides, the education institution, all of the businesses and the African American people not even allowed to see themselves, the homes being taken. Why? And then we want to cry woof at the end of the day when we are almost obsolete. We are guilty. Every one of us. That's what I'm bringing to the table. Without spirituality, we have nothing. This is what keeps a smile on my face. This is what keeps my heart pumping. When I go out there and I see all those little brothers and sisters and these teenage girls and young adults full with alcohol on 3rd and Palou. Why is that black there on 3rd and Palou? It's not in any other community. Why? Start asking yourself the question, why is it that we've been having red tape, I mean, black, uh, yellow tape all of these years? Homicides cleaned up. Why? 
I'm bringing the truth to you without a smile. I didn't raise anything but $500. My, me and my family raised the $500 to be able to pay for my registration. I haven't raised one dime. I'm not interested in your money. I'm not interested in your developers. I'm not interested in, 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 in all of oh, the Lenore and all these et cetera you're talking about. And who, are we, who should we hold accountable? The San, Francisco Board of Edu the San Francisco Board of Supervisors made the announcement that that place was clean. Ms. Chandler. Navy Shipyard was clean. Ms. Chandler, Are we holding the up. Board of Supervisors accountable? No. Ms. Chandler, yes. your time is up. Thank you so kindly. All right, Ms. Berry. What elements will you weigh when taking up concerns of the community which may not be popular with other supervisorial districts or other groups within the district. What the other district supervisors have to realize is that we are all connected. When you neglect this district, you neglect the whole city. So I, I want to be that supervisor to get the other supervisors on board to to care about this district for once in a lifetime. When, when the, you go to the hearing meetings down there, the, excuse me, the Board of Supervisor meetings down there, they often vote on a, different, a lot of different issues. And when a supervisor has submitted some legislation and they win the uh, vote to pass it through, they have a little celebration in their office and it's like a feather in their hat and everybody's happy and goes home with a smile. We need to get to the point where they're happy that they included District 10 for once. We need to get happy that they passed some legislation that affects everybody because we're supposed to be a democratic city and the, uh, the word Democrats like to use is equity, equity, equity. But we don't have that here. District 10 actually has the worst disparity in um, economic income as well. We are the, the, the tale of two cities. We have the have and have nots right in this district. So my goal would be for everybody to realize we're not connected. When you don't educate a District 10 child, it affects the whole city. When someone needs resources, they leave District 10, District 10 and they go down to District 6. District 6 isn't generationally that way. The Tenderloin wasn't that way when I was a child. It was a small group of people that were down on their luck that were down there. But now it's, it's the hub because there aren't resources in other districts. So we need to bring them resources here and let San Francisco be the model city for other cities in the United States that finally start caring about people that do not look like them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last, Mr. Walton. Oh no, this is unfair. How do you plan to address truancy? <laughs> I don't know about you know whether something is fair or unfair or not. We're all answering questions up here tonight. Um, the first thing I do want to do though is have a moment of silence for Joe Taitui, who uh, was murdered. He's a member of the Street Violence Intervention and Prevention Program. Um, that provided outreach and connected our young folks to safety. And he was gunned down a couple of weeks ago. And the last two days we've been spent remembering him and memorializing him. So I just want to ask for a brief moment of silence for him. Thank you. Uh, so with, with that said, um, there, there, there are things that we've done that have worked in the past that we have not had the same resources for to address truancy. So let me give you an example. When I was the director of the Patrell Hill Family Resource Center, we had a program at Daniel Webster Elementary School. So one, you know, if we have a truancy program at an elementary school, that means there's something going on in the home that is causing the, the fact that our children are not going to school. So we put a program, a program together that was funded by the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, where we actually called the children, we woke them up every day, we went and picked them up, we fed them breakfast, and we took them to school. Then after school, we picked them up, brought them back to the center, we provided tutorial, we provided meals, and we did activities with our young folks. We need to bring programs like that back. 
There are some that exist. We do it through beacon centers. There are others that exist. But another thing that we're working on to address truancy is an actual transportation program where we actually go into our areas where our young folks don't have the same adequate transportation. There may be issues going home that are keeping them from going to school. And we go pick them up every day because a lot of truancy comes from transportation. A lot of truancy comes from not being able to have a meal in the morning. A lot of truancy comes from people not having the same resources to buy clothes every day. We need programs that are going to provide the basic needs for our young people and our families. A lot of people are not going to school because they may be ashamed. A lot of people are not going to school because just plain resource things, things that we take for granted. So transportation programs, more resources to go in that so that we're picking up our young people from our public housing hubs. We're picking up our young people from all areas of San Francisco. Because our student assignment system is the way it is, you could be living in Bayview Hunters Point and going to school in the sunset. So we need to make sure that those children get to school. We spend millions of dollars on transportation in, in SFUSD right now. And the majority of it is for special education programs and special needs programs. We are not spending the same level of money and resources for transportation for isolated and disenfranchised communities where most truancy exists. We know what the data says. We know who's truant. We know how it happens. We need to provide an opportunity to get our young folks to school. So it's transportation. It's the resources and basic needs for families that have the deep-seated and deep rooted issues that are keeping our children from going to school. And we've seen some level of success in that, but there needs to be a lot more. As a Board of Supervisor, I will make sure that part of our $11 billion budget goes into our school system. People think that the school district has a, enough resources to sustain itself. We don't. We are in the bottom, bottom half across this country. It's ridiculous and we need to use some of that $11 billion budget to take care of our students as well. At 7.35, um, we wanted to conclude before 8 o'clock tonight. And so we have a couple of little housekeeping things and we want to give the candidates time to mingle with everyone and for you all to ask clarifying questions of them directly. Is that okay with you all? All right, fantastic. So, um, I want to, uh, as we close, thank the members of the Bayview Hill Neighborhood Association who pumped this up and tried to get people out here tonight. Uh, I want to thank Bright for helping coordinate and bringing water and all of the good stuff that they did. I want to really thank the League of Women Voters. You all are amazing with the timing and thank you so much for doing that and the other logistics that you did. Um, Thanks to the Southeast Community Facility for organizing all this. And Ellie just really was amazing finding out that we were overbooked and trying to work it all out. That, that really worked out. And thanks to Dr. Honeycutt and um, uh, Micah Fobbs for yielding their time. And then thank you for Jackie Wright and Wright Enterprises for press releases and media coordination. And thank you to everybody else in the room who helped us uh, get here tonight. Before we end, I'd like to um, bring up Mr. Williams, but I also want to ask, how many people are registered to vote in the room? How many people? Raise your hand. You, young man, you aren't registered to vote? Oh, anyway, um, that's my <laughs> husband, yes. Anyway. Um, if, if you're not registered to vote, please, or if, you're, if you've changed addresses, please go in the back and make sure you get your registration uh, changed so that you can vote. How many people are here from District 10 tonight? All right. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Mr. Williams, did you want to add something tonight? Thank you, baby merchants, for <laughs> dropping in. <tonight. laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I knew I'd left somebody out, okay? Um, again, thank you all for coming. Please take advantage of having all of our great candidates here. I, I do have to say one thing. Personally, I feel like everyone in this panel is extremely dedicated, extremely knowledgeable about our community, 
and we have a great slate of people to choose from. So please vote. Yes. Right. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes.